Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the first Patrick Hannon lecture, would you please welcome Baroness Elinid Morgan. Can I begin by saying what an immense honour it is to be asked to deliver this, the first Patrick Hannon lecture. Patrick Hannon was the preeminent polit political commentator of the 20th century and the early 21st century. His analysis, his straight approach, and his gentle poking fun at politicians earned him admiration throughout the country. Wales is much the poorer without him, but his contribution to Wales will never be forgotten. Patrick would have loved the subject of today's talk. What has devolution done for Labour? And what has Labour done for devolution? From Kinnock to Carwin. I'll attempt to address this question in the first part of my presentation. And in the second part, I'll give some pointers as to the direction I think we should be moving in this great nation of ours. I wasn't going to miss an opportunity like this, was I? Well, it's half term week. And I'm already starting to panic because we have rented a cottage in Mid Wales. But what do we do on Saturday night? I absolutely have to watch X Factor. My daughter will just die without Strictly. And my husband and my son will just be a nightmare to live with if they can't watch the rugby. Now, in our house, it's not a problem. We've got three TVs. But in a cottage with one TV, how are we going to cope? I've been asking myself recently, though, is it necessary for me to have three TVs just to keep peace in the house? Where's my sense of responsibility to the wider society? Am I over-consuming? I personally have to cut back on my individual contribution to using up the world's resources. At what point should I say enough? What is it that drives me? What is it that drives a good society? What is it that drives a happy society? These are questions which good politicians are constantly asking themselves. But in the wake of massive economic turmoil, we're asking these questions with more urgency. I left the European Parliament over two years ago, and this has given me an opportunity to step out of the political bubble and to reflect at arm's length on what kind of place Wales is and should be in the future. My appointment to the House of Lords recently has given me a new platform to expand on some of the things that I've learned during my time in the real world. With the Assembly now a reality and with full legislative powers in around 20 policy areas, we have an opportunity in Wales to rethink what type of society we want for ourselves in the wake of this crisis. As President Sarkozy said, the economic crisis doesn't only make us feel free to imagine other models, another future, another world. It obliges us to do so. But before exploring what we could do using the Assembly, let's look at how the machinery of government was established here in Wales. Now, when I think back over the history of devolution, I can't help but think of Patrick Hannan, a great journalist and commentator dedicated to telling the truth about his country of birth, even if some in Wales might not would have wanted to hear it. But just as Patrick Hannan refused to wear rose-tinted spectacles, so I, as a member of the Labour Party, must be careful not to exaggerate Welsh Labour's contribution to devolution, its successes, its shortcomings. At the very outset, however, it must be stated that devolution would not have happened without Labour. The relationship between labour and devolution is an interesting theme. It's not been an easy journey. There have been bumps and crashes, conciliation and forgiveness along the road. But why start on the devolution path in the first place? The call for devolution came against the backdrop of a democratic puzzle for the Welsh. Time after time in the 20th century, Welsh people were being ruled by a government that they hadn't elected. Labour had dominated the political landscape in Wales, but its voice became very muted 
in a sea of less progressive political voices across the Riven Seven. In addition, it made sense for us to follow the principle that decisions are, take, are best taken as close as possible to the people, where appropriate. So our journey today begins with Neil Kinnock and his outright opposition to the concept of devolution. Neil's arguments were based around a few simple points. Labour at the time was still obsessed with the issue of class politics. And he disliked the fact that through the nationalist arguments, class would be removed from the political agenda and replaced by a resentment against another nation. Separating people into smaller units was anathema to his concept of socialism and the power of the collective. Secondly, he feared the start of a slippery slope towards independence. Thirdly, he didn't believe that the public in Wales supported devolution. And finally, he understood that the Welsh economy was not self-supporting and required continued monetary subsidy from England. His political instincts were correct, in particular in 1979, when only 11% of the population voted yes. I have very vivid images of the absolute divide that was going on in the country when I used to go to my Welsh language comprehensive school in Cardiff, there was great enthusiasm there. And then I'd go back to the streets of Ely and deliver leaflets as a 12-year-old to see the absolute antipathy amongst the public there. During the dark days of Thatcherism, the Tory party seemed determined to undermine the industries on which much of the Welsh economy depended. And with them, Welsh labour values. So no wonder the public opinion and Labour Party opinion changed during this time. There was a real poverty of aspiration and a lack of confidence, in particular amongst some of the young. It was imperative to raise the aspiration of the poorest and convince them that they're as capable as anyone else to succeed. I remember living as a child in the vicarage in Ely in Cardiff, and a friend of my brother's, Hexter, came along to the house and announced to my mother that uh, he was going to be leaving school next month because he was turning 16. He was a very bright child. And my mother said, look, I really think you should stay on and try and do your O-levels. Just another month. Just stay on and, and do this because it'll help you out. Go and tell your mother. He came back the next day and he said, my mother said that exams are not for the likes of us. And what's interesting is that I returned to Ely just a cute couple of weeks ago, and it was quite interesting in the school assembly there. Uh, Lucy McNamara, a very talented young, young woman from Ely, now is succeeding. She has her sights on a university place. So things are moving in the right direction, and that, in small part, is thanks to measures put in place by devolution. Gradually then, in the Thatcher era, the momentum started to gather to put the devolution question back onto the agenda. Now, this was the beginning of devolution, changing the Labour Party, changing policies and changing behaviour. Labour in Wales acknowledged the continuing divisions in the party and in the country, and so they constructed a compromise solution which wouldn't frighten the horses, but would establish a sense of direction if the result proved to be positive. A Labour Party commission on devolution was formed in the 1980s, which was driven largely by Labour Party members and the Labour Party executive, not necessarily the politicians. No radical proposals would come forward, however, whilst Neil was the leader of the party. But when John Smith took over, the issue became centre stage and a manifesto commitment was made in time for the famous Tony Blair victory of 1997. The compromise worked, and in the 1997 referendum, in the wake of a very rapidly organised campaign, the yes vote squeaked in with a slither of a majority. If we were honest, we'd have to admit there was no grand plan. There was no constitutional structure which rel related to other changes going on in the UK at the time. It was a moment of opportunism by people within the party 
who wanted to bring decision-making closer to the people and to provide a bulwark against future Tory governments. The majority didn't matter. The Assembly was established. Labour at the time was the absolute unquestioned political force in Wales. But senior Labour members recognised that Labour would be storing up trouble for itself if there was no mechanism for the public to have a real opportunity to vent its frustration. And with such a dominant party, the existing political structure had to be challenged. The new model, combining first-past-the-post with a proportional top-up system, was a massive departure. The suggestion went against every political instinct of the vast majority of Labour Party members in Wales, as it would doubtless concede ground to opposition parties. It's a little known fact that Tony Blair was instrumental in delivering this model through his appearance at the Wales Labour Party Executive Committee meeting. His persuasive powers helped to establish the political structure that we live with today. This mix of PR and first past the post, I believe makes sense if we want to take the majority of the public with us. It's not healthy for the few to govern for the many, and having a critical opposition generally improves the quality of decision making. It was almost impossible for Labour to win an outright majority in the Assembly, so Labour had to learn to compromise and cooperate in a way that it hadn't had to do in the past. It was painful for the party. But the party has become a more tolerant and less tribal structure as a result. The evolution has also changed the other political parties in Wales. There's been a transformation in the Conservatives' relationship with the Assembly. And Plaid Cymru has very interesting internal frictions in terms of how much independence do they really want. Prior to 1997, Welsh policies were tucked behind UK national policies with the odd revision here and there. Post-1997, the party had to come up with new policy ideas specifically for Wales for the first time. The Labour Party manifesto this year was an exemplary document with detailed proposals. Labour in Wales has demonstrated that it does have the capacity to come up with policy ideas. The real challenge for Labour now is to translate policy into delivery and outputs. The structure of the party in Wales will, at some point, need to be reformed. The party machinery and structure nationally has yet to catch up with the devolution settlement. At some point, there has to be recognition that more support is needed for a governing party and that more respect is necessary within our structures for the leader of a country. At least now, there's a standing invitation for the Labour leader in the Assembly to attend the UK National Executive Committee. This was introduced recently by Ed Miliband. But in an age of devolved government, when Labour has its own elected leader in charge of the country, it's time that the Labour leader in the Assembly became the leader of the party in Wales. Ed Miliband should not be the leader of Labour in Wales. It should be Carwyn Jones. But let me emphasise that the last thing I would want to see is an independent Welsh Labour Party. The UK party structure simply needs to reflect the constitutional changes which have already taken place in the country. Now, immediately after the first Assembly election, Labour was confronted with seat after seat falling to opposition parties. The Wales Labour Party's response to this was crucial and set the tone which has led to today's success. Labour was relaunched with a dragon tail symbol and Welsh identity was recognised as something to be celebrated. Another major change for the party as a result of devolution was the look of the party. It still amazes me that in 1994, yes, 1994, I was only the sixth woman in the history of Wales to be elected to a full-time political position. The look of the Assembly 
was entirely different from any political system that had preceded it in the UK, with equal numbers of Labour politicians of both genders. And when Rodri Morgan announced his first cabinet in the year 2000, there were more women in it than men, a situation which was globally unprecedented. I remember bounding down the pavement from Downing Street to the House of Commons, trying to keep up with one of Tony Blair's key advisers to advise him of our plans to try and have gender equality in our selections. I didn't want him to try and stop us because these were the early days of Blairism when they hadn't quite grasped the concept of devolution, which meant Welsh people deciding for themselves. I do fear, however, that this look will diminish in time unless we continue to have mechanisms to ensure gender fair play. The limited number of women selected to fight for Welsh Labour seats in recent years demonstrates that the party is still not quite reconciled to delivering this without pressure. In the last Assembly election, four Labour women and three Labour men stood down. They were replaced by six men and one woman, although there were a couple of other women elected in other areas. Devolution has also created a new danger for the Labour Party in the UK and in Wales. The reduction in the number of MPs from Wales, partly justified by devolution, means that Wales will not be as highly represented numerically as it now is in Westminster. This will reduce Labour's chances of gaining an overall majority in the UK Parliament. As time goes on, the divergent policy decisions will inevitably lead to greater tensions with the English, who will watch with envy as their children pay university tuition fees, whilst Welsh students will be charged significantly reduced rates. How long, realistically, can we expect any transfer of money over and above that of England to continue from the UK government? If fairness is our mantra, we need to understand that the public's measuring stick will not be limited to fairness within Wales in future, but it'll be measured against our English neighbours and our international competitors. Now, in his book, A Useful Fiction, Patrick Hannan examined the way in which the fragmentation of political structures and allegiances might challenge the authority of central government and alter, beyond recognition, the familiar world run from Westminster. That change is happening. Those structures and allegiances are changing. And the familiar world is not so familiar anymore. So devolution has changed the party significantly and will continue to do so in the next few years.